Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and today I want to talk about some book adaptations of classics and modern classics that I want to watch this year in 2024. I'm generally not much of a movie watcher because I don't really have the attention span to sit through a whole film, but I do like television. I'm much more of a TV person than a movie person. However, this video is going to be both about movies and about TV series. Because as much as I'm not a movie watcher, I do enjoy a well-made adaptation. The books these are based on are all books that I've read and books that I've enjoyed. So there's no hate watching going on here. These are all adaptations I'm genuinely excited for. Some of these adaptations are old, they're classics in themselves. Some of them are brand new and one hasn't come out yet. So let's start with that one that hasn't been released yet, and that is Ripley, a new adaptation of The Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith, a psychological thriller classic from 1955. This is the story of charismatic con artist Tom Ripley, who scams his way to Italy, ostensibly under the pretense of convincing a young man named Dickie Greenleaf to return to his father in America and abandon his hedonistic ways. Things don't go entirely to plan, thriller shenanigans ensue. It's an excellent book, it's dark and twisted and I enjoyed reading it. And now there's going to be a new adaptation coming to Netflix this year. And yes, I am aware of the 1990s movie, I have seen it, but that's not what this video is about, because the adaptation I want to talk about is the one that hasn't been released yet. I'm curious about this, but I'm a bit apprehensive. On the one hand, I love that this is going to be a series. I think it's going to be eight episodes, so hopefully enough time to tell the story in the book, to pace it appropriately. A lot of the appeal of the talented Mr. Ripley is in the quiet moments. I mean, of course, it's a thriller, so there's a good amount of action happening, but it's in those quiet moments where you really feel the coldness of the character and the building tension. So I'm really hoping that the eight episodes is going to be a good amount of space to tell this story. The reason I'm a bit apprehensive about is the casting of Andrew Scott as Tom Ripley. Now, don't get me wrong, Andrew Scott is an excellent actor, no one's gonna forget about the hot priest in a minute. And I fully expect him to portray that irresistible mix of creepy, charismatic, sexy, dangerous, disturbed, all of those facets of Tom Ripley's character. I think Andrew Scott's going to be fantastic at playing that. Surely I can't be the only one thinking he's a little bit too old for the role. Part of what makes Tom Ripley so engaging, I think, is that he is a young man, that he's very good at playing innocent and cheeky and charming in a young man sort of way. I'm not sure Andrew Scott being, I don't really know, in his 40s, in his late 40s, in his early 50s. Sorry, Andrew, if you're watching this, which you definitely are. Like, I don't normally mind if actors are cast in roles that are different ages to them. But I feel like in this case, Ripley's youth is an integral part of his character. So we'll see how they play with that. Okay, I'm just going to look up the ages of the actors who are in this adaptation because I'm curious. There's three central characters in this book. One of them is the aforementioned Tom Ripley, the title character and protagonist of this book. And Andrew Scott is in fact 47. I'm not denying his hotness. I would be foolish to but he doesn't look 20 years younger than he is. The second main character is the young man whom Ripley is supposed to lure back to America, Dickie Greenleaf, and he's played by Johnny Flynn, who played What's-His-Face in Emma. He's 40, so he's a bit younger than Andrew Scott. He does kind of have a baby face. The third character is Marge, who is Dickie's romantic interest. She's played by Dakota Fanning, who is 29. Because while you can totally have 20-year-old men played by actors in their mid-40s, you couldn't possibly have a woman character played by someone older than her. At least go the whole way and cast her 
with an actress in her 40s as well if you're gonna do that to the men and they're all supposed to be the same age. I mean, come on. Come on, Netflix. All right, I admit, that's made me a lot less excited about this TV show. I'm still going to watch it. I hope it's not going to turn into a hate watch. I really want this to be good. The second adaptation I want to talk about is a classic adaptation of a classic novel, and that is A Room with a View, which is an adaptation of Ian Forster's novel of that same name from 1908. A Room with a View is one of my favorite sort of summer classics. It follows a young woman named Lucy Honeychurch on her holiday in Italy, in which she learns a few things about Italy and about romance and about herself when she has an encounter with a young socialist who is also holidaying there and her world is rocked in more than one way. That makes it sound really sleazy. It's actually one of Ian Forster's tamer books. The adaptation of this is a classic 1985 Merchant and Ivory production. Merchant and Ivory who have taken on most of uh, Ian Forster's canon in their time as uh, movie producers and this is one I haven't seen yet. I've seen trailers, I've seen pictures, it looks gloriously 1980s, which somehow works for Ian Forster novels because Ian Forster novels tend to be a very specific brand of sentimental and I think that 1980s aesthetic really works well. They also really get Ian Forster, so I have high hopes for this film. It's got a classic cast of Helena Bonham Carter, Maggie Smith, Judi Dench. I mean, Maggie Smith and Judi Dench in the same film. It's too powerful. Daniel Day-Lewis is in it and in a starring role, the recently deceased Julian Sands, whose performance as George is very much what he's going to be remembered by. Now, I fully trust Merchant and Ivory to put on an amazing romance with beautiful scenes of Florence and the Italian countryside that's going to make me swoon and cry and all of those things. But I'm really curious to see if and how they manage to portray the subtle societal satire that makes the book so special. Because there is a lot of subtlety in the book and subtlety doesn't always translate well to film. So I'm expecting a feast of visual opulence and romance and big feelings and I'm hoping for the depth, the subtle humour and the maybe not so subtle commentary on society that rounds off this really beautiful book. Incidentally, I have done a review of A Room With A View, the book. I'll link that in the description box. The next adaptation I want to talk about is a TV series and this is a new adaptation of a mid-century classic. Midwich Cuckoos by John Wyndham. Yes, I'm aware that The Village of the Damned is an adaptation of this book from the 1960s and is a film classic in of itself, but that's not what this video is about. This is about the seven episode miniseries. Does it still count as a miniseries if it's seven episodes or do you just call that a series at this point? Anyway, uh, came out in 2022 on Sky Max. It's a modernized version of the book, so unlike the book, it's not set in the 1950s, it's set in our current day. The trailer looks appropriately creepy and it's starring Keely Hawes, who's excellent in pretty much everything she's in. So in this adaptation, she's credited for playing Dr. Susanna Zellaby, who I'm assuming is this adaptation's take on Gordon Zellaby from the book. Other than that, I don't recognize many names from the character list. So I'm expecting this adaptation to be very free and not stick close to the book. For one, it's a modernized adaptation and a lot of the things that happen in the book just straight up wouldn't happen in our day and age. It's very much anchored in its time. And since this is not a historical drama, but a modern adaptation, I can see the need to change a few things. Midwich Cuckoos is one of those books that has a really fascinating premise and that is alien pregnancies, basically. So all of the uh, women in a particular unremarkable English village get mysteriously pregnant and give birth to some creepy children who you can tell pretty much from the start aren't entirely human. And then the big question is, what do we do about that? So 
while this book is often described as a horror novel, the creepiness in it is, for the most part, quiet. It's a lot of uh, discussions around ethics, what do we do with this weird situation. It's got some interesting points about bodily autonomy and women's rights and also children's rights in it. It's a great premise, but the weakness of the book is sometimes in its execution and in its characterization. Especially the book has a really entirely irrelevant narrator just plopped into the story, which I'm assuming they get rid of in the TV series. But yeah, otherwise I'm quite excited to see a modern take on this premise and on this story. I think if this was an adaptation set in the 1950s and then the adaptation is very different from the book, I would mind, but since this is a modernized version, I'm curious to see what they do with it. Incidentally, this book I have also done a review video for, which you'll also find linked in the description box. But now let's move on to a classic adaptation of another mid-century classic, and this is The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, which is a film adaptation of Muriel Sparks' 1961 novel of the same name. The adaptation is from 1969, via a stage adaptation. So the book was adapted into a stage play and then the stage play was adapted into a film. This is one of those works where the film is weirdly much more popular than the book. I hear people talk about the film a lot more than the book. And I have a feeling that this film is so iconic that it elevated the book to the status of a true classic. I feel like we wouldn't be talking about the book to the same degree if the film adaptation hadn't been so successful. This is a film that's won Oscars and BAFTAs. Maggie Smith, who stars as the titular Jean Brody, got like a billion awards for it, and I'm sure every single one of them is well deserved. This is a book about a charismatic school teacher, which sounds very Dead Poet Society, but at least the book is anything but that. It shows a morally grey, very dark grey character. It shows methods of teaching that don't just verge on manipulation, but are straight up manipulation. And yet it's not the story of a villain, it's kind of the story of an anti-hero. I feel like that's a word that sometimes gets misused when describing characters. But Jean Brody feels to me like a true anti-hero. I watched a four minute trailer of this, uh, which I'll link in the description box. And to be completely frank, it looks extraordinarily cheesy in a way that the book most certainly isn't. But <laughs> I trust in everyone who says this is an absolutely iconic film that's worth seeing. I'm particularly curious to see how this adaptation deals with the peculiar narrative style of the book and its use of flash forwards, because I can't imagine them working particularly well on film, but we'll see. I think it's entirely possible to tell the story without them, but I think it would lose a dimension of the book that made it quite unique. The trailer seems to show Miss Brody in a more positive light than the book does. She seems to be a much more traditional heroine, underdog type character who is morally good but has to battle for her place in the world every single day. Hoping that the film is not going to be that because I think that would cheapen a very interesting story with a lot of nuance. But as they say, you shouldn't judge a film by its trailer and so I'm definitely going to give this a watch. I know you're getting fed up with me saying this, but I did a review video of The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Guess where you'll find that? Next up, I want to talk about a new adaptation of a book that, if it isn't a classic yet, will be seen as a classic in the future. And that is the new adaptation, the only adaptation of Octavia E. Butler's Kindred from 1979. The book is from 1979, the adaptation is from 2022 and was broadcast on FX. Nope, me neither. I think it's a Hulu thing. The first time I read Kindred by Octavia e. Butler, I was blown away by how cinematic the book reads. There aren't many books that I read and immediately picture a film adaptation for, but for this one, I thought it lends itself so well to be adapted. There's a really visual quality to the book. There's so much movement, there's so much action. 
there's so many visuals in it that you see it in front of your eyes as you read the book. Just begging to be turned into a film or a TV show. Well, they did that. They turned it into eight episodes and then it got immediately cancelled. But before we get to that, let me tell you a bit about this adaptation. So it's a modernized adaptation as well. The uh, original novel is a time travel novel. So most of it is set in the past, in the early 19th century, but the modern day bits are set in the contemporary times of the book, the late 70s. This adaptation has the modern bits set in 2016. It stars Mallory Johnson as Dana, who is a young woman who finds herself unwillingly dragged back into the past where she has to face life as a black woman on a plantation. Every moment spent in the past, she's fighting for her life, she's fighting for her place, and she's fighting to get back to her own reality in the future. I've done a book review video about this because I feel like I very inadequately summarized this book just now. So if you're curious about uh, the book, then do check that out. Link, you know where. As I said, the first time I read this book, I was desperate for there to be a adaptation of this. The second time I read this book, this adaptation was in the making. It was in production. I was reading news updates about it. Then it came out and was immediately cancelled. And apparently, this is not spoiling anything about the book, but apparently this series, which was supposed to be a first series of several, uh, ends on a cliffhanger, which means that the story is still untold, is still unfinished. This is a trend of streaming services in particular that makes me so angry, where they throw budget at a production only to then cut it off before it can properly get going. And finally, the last adaptation I want to talk about is an adaptation for a book I read very recently. And that's The Enchanted April, which is a novel from the 1920s by Elizabeth von Arnim. This is a film rather than a TV show. And it's from 1991, which means it's the same age as me. It features a cast of British national treasures, though I don't know if they were national treasures at the time. Josie Lawrence, Miranda Richardson, Jim Broadbent, just to name a few. It is a story of a holiday to Italy, just like A Room with a View that I mentioned earlier. But The Enchanted April is a lot more mellow. It's a lot less political. It's a lot less satirical, though it also has its moments of satire. It follows four women who basically don't know each other at the beginning of the book and go and rent a medieval castle in Italy together for budget reasons. They're all so different. They all come to Italy with their emotional baggage and then work through their problems while they're there. Oh hey, I did a book review video for this as well in case you want a more in-depth analysis of this book. The film? received praise left, right and centre. It's been nominated for multiple Oscars, it's got very good reviews pretty much everywhere I looked. I think this is one to watch during the summer and I'm hoping for the same... I'm using the word sentimentality in a positive way here, for the same sentimental nostalgia, for the same heartwarming, soul-searching lines that are in the book and the same heartwarming characters that you don't know at all at the beginning, obviously, and then you learn to love and to root for throughout the story. Plus, another film set in Italy. Can never have too many of those. So, those were five... One, two, three, four, five... Six adaptations I want to watch this year. Some TV shows, some films, some old, some new, some classic, some obscure. It seems to be a bit of a lackluster offering in terms of adaptations of classics this year. I feel like in the past few years, there have been a lot more new adaptations of classics. I'm thinking of... Netflix has done a few, right? There was um, Rebecca from a few years ago. Then there was the absolutely horrendous Persuasion. Maybe that trend is passing, which would be a shame, despite the absolutely horrendous Persuasion. I like it when new uh, productions are made of old books because I think that often they bring a freshness to an old story, they make me see it in a different light, and they also bring new audiences to these books, which many of us love, but many of us have never even heard of. 
So, maybe this is the last you hear about my adaptation watching this year. Maybe not. If any of these films or TV shows inspire particular thoughts, then I'll be sure to share them with you on this channel. Until then, thank you so much for watching. Bye.